great honor to be with you all this evening. Um, I am now uh, Vice President of uh, Google uh, Public Policy um, and Government Affairs here in Washington, D.C. And we are really a proud sponsor of Journey to Freedom. It's a proud work to work with the Freedom Center and the IJM and many others in this room. Just briefly, in December of 2011, we provided $11.5 million in charitable grants to a number of organizations on the forefront of this issue, including IGM, Polaris Project, and Slavery Footprint. That support, we hope, will free more than 12,000 people from modern-day slavery and prevent millions from being victimized. Um, I do want to recognize um, Erica Swanson and my other Googlers here who have really been intensely uh, taking Google's resources um, and making sure that we do all we can to be present at events like this. Erica, are you still here? There you are. <laughs> and before we go through the panel, Erica, of course, is sitting next to Mr. John Pepper, a hero for all of us, and one of those people who stepped up and helps to uh, keep this all in our consciousness, and we are just honored to be with you, sir. Mm -hmm. So let me just take a moment, a point of personal privilege, as we say on the other end of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, um, to express my gratitude to allow me to even be a part of this. Um, I served in government for many years and have never been short of words nor breath except in a moment like this. And I guess part of what I feel right now is looking back, and your, your movie is so brilliant because there are those of us, right, who at any time when we talk about what happened, you know, uh, during the Nazi reign or, you know, when there's ethnic genocide or when there was slavery, we all sit there and we think, oh my gosh, what were people thinking then that they could allow this to happen? And yet now, as a former member of Congress, I stand here and I watch the debates that we all debate on issues that are important to our day. But we're not doing a lame duck Congress right now to figure out how we're solving modern day slavery in our own country. And I have two girls, 16 and 13, and I think while I'm watching this movie that I'm raising them to be smart and to be cautious and to be provocative and challenging of the world. And, and yet, you know, 100 blocks away in Fairfax, Virginia, girls their same age are being sex trafficked. And I don't know how to deal with that. I don't know how to raise them with a deeper feeling of how we make it out. And so I guess I'm really grateful to all of you because tonight is not a discussion of the problem, but a discussion of the solution. And I am just so excited to be a part of this, although I feel so ill-equipped um, in being able to stand on the stage with so many people on the stage and people in the White House who have made so many dramatic changes to make sure that we all don't fall back into that comfort level of sleepwalking that makes it a lot easier to not stare evil in the eye. And to all of you who do that every day, um, as a mother of two girls who don't have to, God thanks. Um, face that evil, um, I'm really grateful. So enough about me. Um, I just need, felt the need to explain why I feel so inadequate up here right now. So tonight we've brought together a diverse panel of human rights experts to reflect on this film, which is just amazing, and share their thoughts about what the fight against modern day slavery and what we can learn from the historic experience of American slavery and the work of abolitionists to end it. Um, I think we know everybody on the stage, but permit me a second to reintroduce them. Gary Hagan, recognized by the State Department of one of the heroes fighting mighty modern day slavery. He is the president and CEO of the International Justice Mission and tonight's honoree. And for that, I think you deserve another round of applause. Justin Dillon, musician and documentary producer who produced this wonderful journey to freedom and who also founded slaveryfootprint.org and for this amazing um, work of consciousness raising. Justin, thank you. Wade Henderson, President and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, the nation's premier civil and human rights coalition for keeping us all honest and awake on this issue. Wade, thank you so much for your leadership. 
And Julie Fernandez, a senior policy analyst at the Open Society Foundation, where she works to influence public policy in support of the protection of civil and human rights. For all that you do to keep us all on track, we thank you so much and are grateful. So um, I'm just going to start with one question to the panel, then maybe one each, but I'd certainly like you all to, to think about also um, what your reactions are to this film. First of all, let's, let me do that just for a second. Uh, before we get to the panel, to people who are not as, I mean, everybody in this place is immersed in this issue, that's why you're here. But uh, Ambassador, what's your reaction to this film? Well, I think for me, it, it actually brings the past alive, um, but also it gives that perspective about the people who are in slavery right now, the ones we don't have a name for. 27 million is just a, a figure. Right. But I promise a person. Yeah. And isn't it, it uh, when I was watching it, I was thinking that flipping back and forth, that, oh my gosh, during slavery 150 years ago, if there were issues being debated in the United States Congress, as they are, if there were people of the White House who were embraced in this, you know, you'd think that that would be able to just flip it off. Um, but here we have one issue that everybody agrees with in this town, and it's still so hard to flip it off. Wade, why, why is that? Why is it that, that we just together can't make this happen? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, is that working? Try it. It might be. Or else you can come here. I'm happy to give up the mic. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And good evening, everyone. This is an extraordinary evening. An extraordinary evening. The film is incredibly powerful. And I took two things away from this conversation. First, the global nature mm -hmm. of human trafficking uh, was depicted in a graphic way that really united us all as world citizens against this travesty, and that was extremely powerful. Yeah. Um, secondly, uh, one can't help but see the historic continuum mm -hmm. between chattel slavery as we've known it in this country and human trafficking as depicted in modern times. And this is something that I think American audiences are uniquely sensitive to. After all, this is the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, the film Lincoln, which so powerfully depicts uh, the politics surrounding slavery and the struggle to uh, enact the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolished slavery in this country and helped to set the stage for this challenge. And all of that was brought to bear in extremely powerful terms. And then finally, I came away with an incredible sense of hopefulness. I mean, after all, both Mr. Northrop and Mr. Proom ultimately were able to escape their tradition and to give hope to those who were around them. And I think we take away that same experience. I think part of the reason it's so difficult to focus public attention on these issues, and, and again, this is an honor to be on this panel with such distinguished players. The film, Justin, was incredible, and Gary, your work is just legendary, and Julie, my colleague, has done such an incredible job in this area, is very powerful. But human trafficking is a euphemism that often obscures the tragedy of slavery as we know it in contemporary terms. And most people don't see slavery as a problem. When you mention that there is slavery in the world today, they are prepared to challenge your assumption because there don't appear to be the facts displayed on the ground that would help to confirm that problem. And so I think we really have to go back to use this incredible moment in time I mean, there is a convergence of history and politics and events that gives us a chance to do something dramatic and powerful, to bring the issue of contemporary slavery to a broader public audience and to focus the kind of energy necessary to address it. Lou, you, Ambassador DeBaca, has done a great job. Secretary Clinton has been incredible because by lifting up these 10 activists, she has given this issue a world platform that it would not otherwise have. And I think the administration finally, both with the executive order, with its commitment to use the power of the State Department and the Justice Department to enforce the law, has helped to advance this debate in ways that would not otherwise have happened. Thank you. Another reaction to the film from the audience? 
Yes, ma'am. Right. That's right. And, and I think that's, you know what, that put it in perspective for me. Again, the mother of two, every time I would see the children, um, but the story of slavery and, and losing your rights. And so, Justin, how, how did you decide on, first of all, congratulations, that was just amazing. Um, but how did you decide to pick those, those two men, you know, one from history and, and, and one today to help tell the story for everybody? Um, I'd love to say that there was some brilliant linear path uh, to choosing that, but this project really came up uh, uh, in June. Um, just as the heroes were being chosen and announced. And so we really started off with, with 10 heroes. And I think that's a great place to start when you're talking about um, such a complex and difficult and, and yet to be known issue in the world. You started with solutions. And I don't call them activists, I call them solutionists. These are people that are taking a problem and figuring out solutions in their own ways. And so that was very exciting to me. It just so happened that one of those solutionists was Vonnet Broom, who also happened to be a survivor. And so that really keyed us into how are we connecting this to, of course, all the amazing work and the, uh, just the, the visual um, imagery that you receive when you walk through the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. You, you bring that together. It just so happened that we came across the story of Solomon Northup. And here is this, you know, uh, someone who was published who was, in fact, trafficked. A free man who was trafficked. And we just saw the story start to come together. And so it was just a, a very quick and rapid connecting of the stories and seeing if we can find. And it really was, you know, the stories don't line up perfectly. But there's enough connection points where you're like, wow, history just just not a lot of imagination here, you know? It just keeps repeating itself, the same types of exploitation. Yeah. Other reactions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. So oh, wait, wait, we need, I've got to remind, I, we need to talk into a microphone? Do we have one? Okay. <laughs> if someone watching the film and um, wanting to do something further after seeing it, for instance, related to Maria, who is a lawyer and had wanted to be a judge but became so concerned mm -hmm. about corruption in her own neighborhood that she uh, started to obviously become very committed and involved on a, on a worldwide scale. If someone with those aspirations, for instance, for instance, a young person, an older person, wanted to connect with her, how would someone do that? Because the film does not um, tell you that at, at its close. It's a fantastic film. I've seen it twice now. It's brilliant. And it plays very well in this auditorium. But how would someone reach out to, uh, as one individual, uh, take a small step to make uh, a huge difference in the world? Good question. Why don't we have the whole panel answer that? Because I think you're all individually suited to give us advice. So, Justin, you have the microphone. Do you want to start and then pass it? Sure, just very briefly. Um, you know, we've been asking ourselves, those of us that have been working in this space, many of our colleagues here tonight have been asking ourselves that question for 10 years. And I think um, if history does look back and call this a movement, which I think we need to just let history have that, that voice, because we're still working, putting our heads down and keeping going. But if it calls it a movement, one of the things they're going to notice about this time is that people were figuring it out for themselves. Um, just like you know, 200 years ago, people were overwhelmed by the issue and they got involved. And one of the privileges that I've had of seeing young people and not so young people uh, get involved in this issue and just get in and figure it out themselves. I wish there was some perfectly planned network that was anyone can just plop themselves into. But to be quite honest, we're just not there yet. And, and even the, the network that we display in history was not perfectly tuned and whatnot. It was just people getting in, into the mess, as Cornell West says, into the funk, and figuring it out for themselves. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, I think that, I think one thing, just to answer your question, to also reflect a little bit on the film, and I think that they can be related, is that I think that the Emancipation Proclamation moment was a moment in a long journey throughout our whole history. So that it isn't that the Emancipation Proclamation abolished slavery. 
We actually didn't abolish slavery, right? It was a moment of significance of ending a form of chattel slavery in certain parts of our country. But many of the sort of traps that people who are enslaved, were enslaved were in continued after that moment. And we've been struggling in our country ever since then to kind of complete that circle as well as kind of reflect it around the world to say slavery's been around the world forever since the beginning of time, whether it's sex or labor with children or adults, women and men. And we have to continue this struggle that we've all been on for a long, long time. So I think in terms of what we can do about it, I do think I agree with Justin and also think we have to look first in our own communities because we, we can try to think of this because it is a worldwide problem, but it is also right here. And it's right here in Washington, D.C. It's right here in people's homes in this town. And it, as we see in newspaper accounts of domestic um, servants in this town being enslaved and becoming aware of where the shelters are in our community or what the laws are in your community. What are the victim services in your community? Are there comprehensive services? Do they treat all victims? The kind of questions, and there are many groups here who work in this, but you can start right here and then think about how you build out from that to be able to have an impact um, both here and around the world. Thank you. Before you give up the microphone, though, I do want you just to address to this question, but to the larger question, how do forming these partnerships um, or, or, or um, combining organizations, how does that help us to advance? Because I know there's something that you've worked on. I guess I'm looking for like the echoing effect of, of what we can all do here when we leave here tonight. Well, that's, that's really what it is, Susan. There's an echoing effect. There's also a strength in our coming together to see this issue from many different perspectives. Many people who work in the world of modern day slavery come to this from different perspectives. So some come to it from the children's rights perspective, others women's rights, workers' rights. They, and they found themselves, I think, over the years thinking, are we all working on the same problem? I think we're working on the same problem. Who are you? Who are you? This is what we're about. We're all about human dignity and liberty. And so I think that for, for the, it, it creates strength in our being able to see the problem in all of its multifaceted ways, to create that echo chamber in the different communities with whom we have currency, right, to the immigrants' rights people, talk to the children's rights people and the women's rights people, so that we all are echoing each other in our communities, and that we do create what could maybe at some point be called a movement so that we're speaking the same language about basic human dignity. And this is not a side issue, and it's not an afterthought issue, and it isn't something to worry about later. It is fundamental to who we are in many different ways, and we all care about it. Bravo. That's what I think. Woo! <laughs> well then. So, Gary, first of all, to the question, what more can we in this audience do to help you and help others on this stage deal with this? Well, I think, uh, first of all, we can show other people the movie. Um, Justin and the team and Google and all the sponsors have done a, a tremendous amount of the work for us, which is to say most people, I uh, think, in our communities uh, just don't know. Uh, busy lives, distracted lives, good people just do not know that there are millions of people literally held in slavery. And the way we get information about our world uh, frequently just moves us from either obliviousness, where we just we have no idea, and then we see something like this or something on, on CNN, and then we move from obliviousness to the paralysis of despair. Right? We got two stops. I know nothing at all. Or now, I know so much, I have no idea that I could actually do anything helpful at all. That's your point. So now the, the struggle is to get to that place of responsible knowledge, right, where you now know and now you're actually going to try to do something about it. And I think um, that's the first step is to, to, to move people 
uh, to knowledge with hope. And that's what this, this film gives us. Uh, the, the sort of uh, industry of, of despair, the industry of, well, if you're really sophisticated, you'll understand there's really nothing anyone can actually do about it. Uh, that has a certain appeal, but believe me, nothing is more empty to a person who is in that situation than somebody saying, well, you know, this is really complicated. I don't know we can do anything. And if you're the person in the situation, like, you would say, well, yeah, but really me? There's really... There's nothing you, I'm impossible. You can't do something about my situation. And then the, the experience at International Justice Mission is that you do that a few hundred times. You do that a few thousand times. You start to think, oh, there are some, some patterns. There are some commonalities. There's actually some things that make this fight uh, quite winnable. And for us, that is sort of the linchpin next, which is fundamentally, I, from our perspective, in many respects, it's going to be about law enforcement switching sides. Uh, because it's very hard for trafficking to flourish at a high level um, without the complicity of, of local law enforcement. And um, there's going to, once, uh, once we address that, there's going to be sort of the harder aspect to get to, but there's a massive amount of trafficking that would go away if law enforcement simply uh, switched sides. And by that, I mean protecting the victims of slavery rather than the perpetrators of slavery. Um, if you uh, got to see this fabulous uh, Lincoln film, which is the, you know, the celebration of a law being passed, and why does everybody celebrate a law being passed? Because they think a law is going to be enforced. Right? How sad it would be if, like, we've passed the law, but it will not be enforced. Right? Who cares? And, but the truth is some people in the world get law enforcement and some people do not. And the traffickers are looking nonstop for the people who are not getting law enforcement. They're the marginalized, the poor, the disenfranchised. Because I'm a trafficker. I don't want to work hard at this. I want to work easy at this, and I don't want to get in trouble. So I'm going to actually scour the earth to find the people who simply don't get law enforcement, and that's who I'm going to, to prey upon. So I think that is one of the priority tasks that we can uh, engage together. Well, th thank you, and, and Wade, before we ask you, I, I think that, to me, that's what I love about the Freedom Center, too, is that it's, it does provide hope, and I think that is sort of the linchpin to getting people to actually read these stories and get engaged. If you can't give them a solution, it's just too painful. It's too painful to know that people are that evil unless you can say, well, here's what you yourself can do about it, and then people will want to do that. And just as a, as a um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, but Google's going to be putting this on YouTube. And so hopefully we're going to be, just keep it between us until, uh, <laughs> except for the cameras there. Um, so hopefully we'll be, Justin, being able to use this and use YouTube to get more and more people to see this because it is a story of, of hope. I mean, it's, it's tragic and it's demoralizing, but it also has that pattern to show that there, you know, there can be happy endings when good people get involved. And it, and it just takes a few of them, right, in both cases to make that change. So, uh, Gary, thank you for that, that uplifting note. So, uh, Wade... What else can people do? Well, let me say I thought it was a great question, and I think it really uh, goes to the heart of how we use both the film and the moment uh, to try to make the next steps, small though they may be, in connecting the dots, in helping to form collaboration, in stimulating the kind of work that you already see taking place between the State Department, the Freedom Center, Google, and the players who helped bring both the film and the moment into sharper focus. So a couple of things. I hope the film will help promote an action-oriented agenda. There needs to be an action component, perhaps not uh, you know, in the film, obviously, but tied to the film so that individuals who see it, who want to take action, can have some things to do, both in advising them on the organizations that engage in these activities in a reputable way, and also what they can do individually to help promote greater awareness and to form the dot, you know, bring those dots together. Secondly, and this may sound self-serving, uh, coalition politics is essential in the 21st century if we're going to advance the goals that we share in common. If you're not working in coalition, you're not working collectively to solve the problems of the time. And this is not a partisan issue, it's a national issue. So in order to bring the kind of solutions to bear 
And that includes not just politically, but from a community perspective, getting the business community engaged. We're going to have to reach out beyond individual parties or silos to try to come across people with the powerful moral dimension of this issue. This has as much moral power today as the abolitionist movement prior to the Emancipation Proclamation's issuance did in its time. And it is that grassroots sense of fire and injustice mm -hmm. that really will help to drive with the energy needed to connect the dots and to form meaningful relationships. But you have to give people something to do. And one last point, and I thought, you know, Julie's uh, observation was really correct. You start in your communities. You know, you think globally, but you act locally. And you begin to form relationships that help to address these issues. Americans, of all people, should understand both the horror of slavery, the difficulty in its eradication, and what is needed to bring contemporary solutions uh, to the problem. And so this moment that we've talked about, you know, the Lincoln moment, the Emancipation Proclamation moment, the museum, which really connects historic injustices with contemporary problems, is the kind of thing that we hope can be used as a stepping stone to greater development moving forward. I think it's essential. Wonderful. Although I do want to say, oh, Lordy, if this is a partisan issue, then I give up. <laughs> we have any questions from the audience? We have a, a few moments. OK, I guess we can let you speak. I don't have a question. I'll say quickly that for any, first, for any additional questions, we do want to ask people to grab the mic because we are recording this. Oh, sorry. Um, so, so I think folks will, will, have, will have them over there. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, and then the second is that uh, uh, we do want to show this though as much as we possibly can. And uh, if you go to freedomcenter.org, uh, this week, there'll be a link. Right now, you can go and there'll be a lot of information about the film that you can uh, download and share. Mm -hmm. But also, there will be uh, a link to the YouTube site that we are uh, so generously being um, supported with Google by that you'll be able to, to watch the whole film. And finally, uh, please, if you go to our website, you'll see how to contact me. Please feel free to contact me at any time, and I'll mail you a copy of the DVD mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to go out and show it to somebody. Because we want this to be seen, as everyone's saying, Great. It does, as much as possible. Uh, so please, uh, please, please do engage with that. And finally, if anyone happens to be tweeting right now, uh, please use the hashtag Journey to Freedom if you happen to. And if you're not doing it, go ahead and start it. <laughs> right now, we, as, we at Google do not consider it inappropriate if you take out your cell phones and tweet right now. Well, I guess they shouldn't tweet, but send Gmails. Um, I'm, a little, I'm a little old. <laughs> um, questions from the audience. We have a, a few moments, and I, I know this is um, such a special evening. Everybody wants to. No? Okay. Well, then let's take advantage of the few moments left. Um, and, and first of all, to salute, let me salute everybody here because I believe that you are solutionists. Is that the right phrase? Um, and, and that, you know, maybe we will look back. Maybe Justin will be making a movie of all of us someday, 50 years from now, that we all showed up at this moment of the movement. Um, Justin, for, for, your, um, for your courage um, and your passion um, to decide to make a bold U-turn, to, to knock all of us on the head, to say, hey, here's what's going on here, and we fix it. We're very grateful. Do you have any closing statements you'd like to make to the people here? I know we're all grateful for your artistry and your compassion. Thank you. Um, some of my favorite people in the world are, are here tonight. So this, this feels, from, for someone from a far off land in California, this feels very, um, very safe. Um, <laughs> never in my life did I ever think that I would get to make a film with a museum in the State Department. <laughs> And this is, this is the beauty of the coalition of the willing. This is, this is what movements are made out of. It's, it's the unlikely partnerships that come together and make something, and everyone takes a level of risk. Because there was great risk in making this. It's great risk in having me do it. It's great risk in going to some of the places in the world that we went to. Um, all the filmmakers, the, 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 the individuals involved in it, gave their heart and soul for this. 
Um, but really, um, for, for the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center and for, for JTIP, for getting behind this so quickly and lighting something, I don't think there's ever been a film greenlit and funded and finished and packaged in the history of filmmaking, this one. And so I'm just really grateful to, to get to be a part of it at all. Thank, Thank you. you. Julie, closing statements for all of us, please. Just that I've been, like everyone, impressed with um, not just this film, but really, I have to say, impressed with the dedication, passion, drive, intellect, and just the beauty of all the activists that I have had the privilege to work with in this field of trying to fight modern-day slavery and human trafficking. It's some of the best people that are in this business of advocacy or in this world. And I'm, I feel privileged just to be here with all of you. Thank you. Uh, Gary, I'm going to skip you for a second because you're our honoree, and I'm going to go to Wade so you can close this out. Mr. Henderson, oh, well, if you well, can give us some your reflections well, as well. someone who has dedicated his life to really. graciously it's, making change. Well, well, thanks for asking. And, and I guess closing this out, I would just underscore the unique power in the moment and in the issue and the moral suasion that comes with this that can influence hearts and minds. And that's what it's going to take. So I would just encourage us to be creative about using um, our contacts and our ability to inch us forward in ways that we haven't previously discussed. So when Gary mentioned the importance of getting police, and you were speaking in the global sense of becoming, switching sides, becoming players, well, in this country, that is probably not quite the problem, but certainly making police aware of the issue in their respective communities and making this film and the discussion that comes with it more readily available. So I would love to see this shown on a Human Rights Day, uh, December 10th on Capitol Hill, because it's an easy venue, and Lame Duck is here, and members are going to be there. Make sure they're aware of it. Their staffs will come. It'll make a difference. This is one area where the United States has excelled in both its enforcement initiatives and in sort of setting the stage for other countries, even, uh, you know, Western European countries as well, uh, because of the executive order, the legislation that exists, things that can move us forward. Now, that doesn't mean we beat our chests, but it does mean that we take the campaign to international organizations that speak to these issues. So it's not simply the U uh, United Nations and appropriate committees. It's the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. It's the regional bodies, the African Union, uh, you know, bodies in, uh, in uh, South America. So all I'm saying, guys, is this is a time to use social networks, our media uh, advisors, to think about a campaign that helps to really bring communication strategy and advocacy uh, to what is needed and to think in concrete terms about how we'd like to prioritize the conversation. And, and Gary, before, because um, I, I really want yours to be the last voice we hear this evening. Um, I do want to thank um, everybody for being here. I want to thank you for giving me, you use the word, uh, Julie, privilege. I mean, I just feel incredibly privileged um, to even stand in front of this amazing group here, group here, to talk about this issue. Um, I want to thank um, Secretary Clinton for having us here. I want to thank Tina Chan, I don't know if she's still here, for welcoming us and all the work that she has done along with the Secretary to advance this issue. Of course, I want to thank um, President Obama for making this an international issue and standing up as a spokesperson. Um, I want to thank um, M Ambassador DeBaca for the hard work that he does traveling all the time, again, going into sort of the pits of hell to find um, heaven's angels, and um, we're so grateful for that. And I guess now um, we're going to be seeing you all on, a, on December 10th somewhere on Capitol Hill. <laughs> we'll be in touch, because that's a really great idea, and I think you're happy to, to be there with me, Ambassador, right? Good, you all heard that. Okay, it's a date. Um, again, to all of you, um, to John Pepper, to everybody here, thank you for giving me this great option. And, and Gary, you are our honoree this evening, and you were one of those points in that amazing map, and you have traveled around this world and met other solutionists, abolitionists. And so I guess I would just hope that you would close us out um, on a note of mercy, um, but also hope. 
Thanks, Susan. I I, I do want to express my thanks, though, especially to the the uh, the Google Corporation for partnering in this. This is. Google is way out in front of the world on this because this is a controversial issue, a complicated issue, and for uh, Google to get out in front and be a leader in this will be something uh, your grandkids will be proud of. Um, the, the, the one thing I would urge upon us um, is just that when you spend time with the traffickers, you are impressed by how committed they are to the struggle. They, they care a lot about prom. They get up every single day caring about prom and making sure he has nowhere to go. And at the end of the day, this will be a struggle of who's more committed. And so it would just be good for us in these moments to just reaffirm, oh yeah, this is not one evening uh, or even a, a, a season. This is probably uh, a long march that's going to require some, some measure of commitment. Uh, the, the, the second thing that, um, that I'm uh, impressed by is just by the way history filters complexity, right? That there's just no way that our grandkids are going to uh, be as unclear about what, they, what ought to have happened in, in this era. And uh, in that same way, uh, I think what we want to do is struggle through and fight through to that place of clarity that motivates action and sustains committed action uh, from the same perspective that we imagine our grandchildren will look upon this era. Um, and be because this is going to be addressed, um, the hope of history substantially is that justice prevails. As Martin Luther King said, and as President Obama likes to reflect upon, uh, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards history. And the great dignity that history gives us is to be part of bending that arc. And uh, that is, I think, the great hope that we get to walk away with, is we're invited to that historic work of bending the moral arc of the universe, that it will take effort and exertion, and it will also begin with the... Uh, with the sense of that this is so important that if we were to transport people right now to the places where trafficking is taking place, people wouldn't have questions about what they should do next. They would see the suffering and the brutality and there would be instant clarity. Likewise, in terms of coalitions and working together, whatever it is that divides us, whatever it is that seems significant, in the lens of history looking back on why people were having little uh, fights and struggles with each other instead of getting on common ground and just uh, meeting the need, those things will seem so trivial and insignificant and just uh, sad distractions. So putting, a small small, putting aside small things, putting aside uh, manufactured uh, complexity, uh, seeking and driving forward to clarity, the kind of clarity we would have if the, if the abuse was before us right before our eyes, that I think is the struggle in which we're invited to lead in, and I'm grateful for Justin and the team that put this film together, and uh, we would like to just recommit ourselves to telling the story, telling the truth, and uh, bending that arc of history. So thank you. One of the things that I learned as a young trial uh, attorney is when uh, you should just stand up in front of the jury and say, okay, he's guilty, and then <laughs> shut up and sit down. Um, but of course, none of us ever do that. Um, I want to thank uh, our panelists. I want to thank everyone uh, for coming out uh, tonight. Um, but I also, um, because um, I think that we've seen so much positive energy um, over the last uh, week and a half um, with uh, what has been described as a movie about getting a bill passed. Um, it's a little longer than Schoolhouse Rock, um, but uh, it, uh, it, they still take it on up to, to Capitol Hill. Um, at the end of the day, that is what we do. People ask us, why does the United States do a report every year? Why does the United States care what country X, Y, or Z is doing in order to fight this problem of modern slavery? People have even asked, and they certainly, when I was a young uh, lawyer in the Civil Rights Division, U.S. Attorney's Office has asked, why the hell are you in my district? And other countries now 
say the same thing when we go to their to their jurisdictions. Why are you coming in here to tell me what we should be doing with our fill in the blank? Palm oil, prostitutes, maids, etc. It is a civil rights struggle. We sometimes artificially make a distinction between a human rights struggle overseas and a civil rights struggle here at home, but it is a civil rights struggle. And anybody that asks, why does the United States put out a trafficking report? Why is this part of foreign policy? Why is this an important part of domestic policy? There's one sentence in that movie. When Abraham Lincoln is answering the question of his cabinet saying, why do we have to do this now? Why do we have to burn all of this political capital to get this done before the inaugural, before the end of the lame duck? Haven't you asked so much of us? And Lincoln finally, after having spent four and a half years being opaque and vague and not even really telling his own people how he was going to get to where he was going, he finally says, because I'm afraid if we don't do it now, we'll never get it done. We won't have the votes. The South will come back, and they'll have votes. And, and it's not just, and this is the thing that just blew me away, it's not just about the people now. We will not preserve freedom for the future. Every time somebody stands up in court, on a trafficking case here in the United States. They're enforcing the 13th Amendment against someone who dared to enslave someone in the United States. And every time we, on your behalf, go out to another country and encourage them to have a shelter, to have a law, to bring traffickers to justice, we are enforcing the 13th Amendment. And so as a result, and Gary already uh, is a member of the tribe, uh, but uh, we have cast for ourselves, and the people in the Trafficking in Persons Office carry proudly our unit coin, which bears on one side the statue, the, excuse me, the Liberty Bell, an abolitionist symbol from the 1830s, and on the other side, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. And so in thanks for all of the work that each of you have done, and in thanks for you coming out tonight, I'd like to make sure that each of you has one of our coins as well. So thank you.